You want to show? You want to show? What did you make? What did you make? What did you make? Did you make the bee? Ooh, so the bumblebee. <laughs> You know, with these teeny little wings, it seems like they shouldn't be able to fly. You made a bee. You but made a bumblebee. They do. And I think I, I feel that same way about Lucy, you know? <laughs> she may not do all of the things that other kids do. She may not do all the things I expected. Even though she can't, she can't talk. She's got so much to say. She's got so much to give. She lives such a full life. Right. Hey, Bertie. Oh, there's mommy. She's just adored and happy and vibrant and hilarious. We didn't even know if she would live. We didn't even think she would live. She's known that, wow, I got a lot of expectations to live up to. You know, she's had to do her part in this thing. You know, it's, it hasn't been just Grace and I hoping and believing, it's been Lucia hoping and believing herself. She just is the most extraordinary little person. You know, I just couldn't possibly possibly love anybody more, you know? She just brings so much goodness to this world. So much perspective and love and, and tenderness and purity and goodness and just all things good is, that's our Lucy. So when Lucy was born, you know, it was, you know, dramatic, obviously, just like it is with any um, pregnancy. But when she finally came out, her APGAR scores, which kind of assess, you know, the, the health of a baby, um, were very high. Um, the doctor was very pleased, and we were just ready to move forward, spend a day or two in the hospital, and, and take our sweet little girl home. Lucy cried when she uh, when she came out, and after that first cry, you know I didn't hear anything again for quite some time from her. She was also very sleepy. And she just kept getting more and more sleepy, to the point where she wouldn't wake up and she wouldn't feed. Um, and this is just in that first day, you know. And it was by about about 36 hours after she was born, um, they they saw signs of seizure and she still had not woken up. So at that point, they said it's time to go to the NICU. And they were trying to like, we'll take her out of the room to the NICU, take her from me. And I just screaming, no, you can't take my baby away from me. Don't, you're not taking her anywhere. You know, and I'm bawling. And, I, and then I said, just wait in, at least until my husband comes back. But they were worried about her. They, she wasn't waking up. So um, then we, we, you know, we realized how serious it was. They checked her blood. They did a MRI. They started, you know, checking her brain activity. Everything, um, just trying to figure out what could possibly have gone wrong. I mean, every single test under the sun was done to their capacity. Everything kept coming back. She's perfect. There's no nothing answers. wrong with her. She's perfect. There's nothing wrong with her. But she, um, you know, her breathing continued to, to decline and she finally had to get a, you know, a breathing tube inserted in, in her throat so she could breathe. And it was heart-wrenching to see her with that, with that down her throat. It was absolutely 
wretched. And she's on all of these tubes everywhere. She's just connected everywhere you can think. And she's got the feeding tube. And she's, you know, she's just on all these wires and tubes. And you're just looking at your baby going, how did it get to this? She was just perfect. We were going to go home today. Oh, what? What, Lucy Larkin? It started looking worse and worse and worse, and there was no improvement. So we were just, at that point, starting to worry that she was going to die. She's not breathing. She's not eating. She's having seizures. What's going on with Lucy? She's a baby, little Lucy Larkin. She's my honey, little honey sweet baby. How you doing, baby? You're just being a sweet girl today right now. Can I do anything while you're gone? Aren't you? Yes. You know, this breathing machine that Lucy was on, it, it showed the pulse of the machine doing the work, and then it also had another another color line that showed the, the work that the patient is doing as they breathe. And, you know, the, the one for the patient was just flatlined, like Lucy was, was not trying to breathe on her own at all. Um, and then all of a sudden we see this little spike, we see this little bit of this other color line come in. A little flutter, showing her taking her own breaths under there. Yeah, yeah, and the nurses got excited. They're like, hey, God, this is, this is what we usually see when a patient pulls out of their, you know, their problem. We were jumping around. I mean, this was the first, the first good thing that had happened. If we'd gone like this, and then we get this little, this little glimmer of hope, and she starts yeah. taking these tiny little breaths. And it got better and better, and, and over and about bigger. 24 hours, it got to the point where they were comfortable, like recommending, you know, extubating her and taking this tube out of her throat. Oh. And. Um, we just felt like we had overcome this hurdle and, and it was about to end and we were going to be okay now. We thought, okay, we'll just pack up and we get to probably go home tomorrow. She's breathing and we just thought she'd bounce right back at that point, you know, and then that's crushed all over again. <laughs> We were like, all right, let's wait a little bit longer. She's gonna wake up and it's gonna, everything's gonna go back to normal. Well, days passed. We still hadn't seen her eyes again. We saw them when she was born for a few hours and then she still hadn't opened them. We hadn't seen them since that very yeah. first bit. Workout. that these doctors you know, couldn't solve the, the, the riddle that we were up against. So we decided as a couple that we were gonna transport her by a helicopter to, to Stanford Children's Hospital. <laughs> Grace and I could not uh, get on the helicopter with her. There was no room, so we jumped in a car and I think we got to, to San Francisco in three and a half hours, just going as fast as we possibly could. Um, you know, the whole time wondering if she was going to be there when we, you know, when we got there, if she was going to be alive. We finally met up with Lucy again and uh, we checked her in. You know, after a few days of tests and you know, a lot of deliberation between the doctors, they finally figured it out and they said, okay, this is what your daughter actually has. So we got her diagnosis and it was, um, I don't know how many times I could say it was the biggest shock of my life, but at that point it was the biggest shock of my life because we finally had an answer. You know, the doctors had a difficult time di diagnosing her still. It took them about 24 hours to really pinpoint what they thought it was. And they finally did, and they did all the tests. And uh, 
and they determined it was this thing that we had never heard of called NKH, non-catonic hyperglycinemia. And I remember just thinking that, that seems... There's no way. That seems odd. And like, and then I looked up the statistics on it and I was like, there's no possible way. It's this rare. I'm like, no, it can't be. We did all the tests, all the genetic tests. Everything was clear. It's impossible. You know, do a Google search for NKH and imagine that being your child. It's something that is, you know, very difficult to swallow. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Let me just see something. Let me see that face. Oh, say hi for the camera. There. Oh, she says, no, this is the pit. When we left Stanford, they sent Lucy home on hospice. And we took that long drive with her in the car hooked up to a feeding pump that was hanging there and she was having seizures and, you know, the five hour drive to Reno took us 10 and we weren't even sure if we'd keep her alive that long in the car. Well, yeah, when you bring your child home from the hospital, well, you don't expect them to be on hospice for one thing. I just remember saying over and over, babies shouldn't be on hospice. I just, I remember just saying that to anybody who would listen if I had any contact with anybody at all. I just said, babies should never be on hospice, you know? Yeah, but, so our experience bringing her home was very different than most parents. And um, it was really terrifying. <sighs> and then the doctor said, there's no cure for this disease. And no that, meaningful treatment. Right. There's no cure. There's no meaningful treatment. There's nothing that we can give her that's going to help her. You know, he, he explained that in his experience that we not medicate this girl, that we just let her go and start over. He said, it's going to be difficult for your wife to understand that, but he's like, I recommend for you and the future of your relationship with your wife to let your daughter go. Otherwise, you're going to be, you know, keeping her alive for six months and then she's going to go. He's like, what would you rather have? Are you just hanging out, Lucy Mark? Just cross legged, just chilling. Mm. This is hilarious. When we finally were able to open our door and bring our daughter in, into our home, there was something kind of calming about that. Um, and there was, we had this, all of a sudden there was a little bit of joy and, and some spark of like, this isn't going to be too bad, we can handle this. Then listen to you want your binky? Huh? Huh? Yeah. There, baby. And that immediately went away when Lucy started going into these seizure fits that we couldn't control for anything. We couldn't figure out what medication was going to help her. And when we finally did, you know, talk to Stanford again and ask them, which, which one of these medications do we give her to help the seizures? And their answer was, I'm sorry, but we don't have an answer. We don't have a way to stop the seizures. That's part of NKH. See, this is your papa, loves you so much, and your mama loves you so much. And that was the beginning of, you know, our home life experience with her and trying to raise this child that was on the edge of death, you know, every waking moment. Every day. Every... There's so many confusing feelings because she was suffering. You know, she was suffering. And I didn't want her to suffer. I, want, I wanted her more than anything in the world. She's all I wanted. I just wanted my Lucy. I wanted her to be okay, and I wanted her to be with me and with Steve. But 
she was suffering. And every day, you just don't know, is she gonna make it through the day? I'm like, I couldn't, that's why we couldn't let her sleep in her, away from us. Just afraid that she just wasn't gonna make it through that day. And part of you, you feel guilt because you think, well, maybe that would be better for her, you know? And then you feel, you hate that thought, but you just, you're trying to find what's the right thing for Lucy? What's the best thing for her? You know, how can she, you know, her quality of life? I need her to be happy. I need her. <sighs> Look at you go. He dancing, dancing bird. It's a dancing bird. You could power a boat with those things, huh, Lucy? Huh? <laughs> Good job, Buggy. When she was a baby, I actually used to really struggle. This is just from, you know, the end of the day yesterday. That's just through part of the day. And, you know, if you told me I was gonna be, you know, mixing supplements and medications on my own, I would never have believed you, but. NKH is a very complex disease um, that needs, that needs a, a lot of study. This is just part of our lives. I mean, every day we're washing and using more and more <laughs> syringes, and I come up with different systems for organizing. NKH stands for non-ketotic hypoglycemia, um, and it is a disease of a failure to cleave glycine, which is a small amino acid. Um, and this failure to cleave glycine results in increase in glycine as well as decrease in the products of glycine cleavage. And um, those two things combined result in a lot of the problems of NKH. Severe NKH is uh, very severe. Children can have as many as a uh, hundred seizures a day. It's just really hard. Um, they have low muscle tone. It affects the overall development of the child. So um, there are constant crises. It will manifest often uh, within a day and uh, usually picked up by lab screens where the glycine is very high and the baby is unresponsive or having seizures. There's also a real need to develop the muscle and the musculatory system of, of, the, of the child. So it's, it's really a very difficult disease for the patient, the patient family, and clinicians. And with respect to the families, they really love their kids. You know, they need our compassion. I mean, everybody needs compassion. But, um, you know, they don't really need our pity. They, they need for us to understand what it is, is would improve their health and, you know, take that very seriously. The patients live with the disease every day and the patient's families can tell you a lot. They can really teach you a lot about it's very inspiring, you know, it's it's really gratifying to see uh, a child do better because of uh, what you're working on. Yeah. Good job, Buggy. Oh, good job, Buggy. <laughs> good job. <laughs> Baby. What are you doing in your new fancy stroller? Look at you in there. See if she'll open up. Open up. Open up. Here he comes. Here he comes, your bite. There was never a doubt that we were gonna fight. Huh? We were gonna fight. And, you know, it all started to make sense. 
<laughs> and our hearts and our world started to open up when she was 10 months old. And she actually started smiling. I cannot believe how happy you are. And we got that first smile and it was like the parting of the clouds. It was everything. And her big sparkling eyes and her big soft cheeks and that huge smile. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. Just the way that it, you know, the smile shaped her face and these big, you know, juicy cheeks kind of separating and these these lines that came in. We'd never seen them before, you know? Yeah, it was just, it was, a, it was like a miracle. <laughs> so much kickings. So much, so much kickings, bug. <gasps> Give me the smiles, mommy. We were so proud. We were so happy that <gasps> we just kept fighting. It was just that little bit of an extra push to say, you guys are doing the right thing. We're on the right track. Yeah. We needed that so bad. She gave us that smile, and the seizures calmed down a lot around that time. Can you say, Papa? How about you say, hey, Papa, I love you. It felt like we were getting a little bit of a handle on this thing. You know, a, a few months passed, and we felt like, you know, she's, she's getting better, not getting worse. And that's all we were looking for. It's like, if we can get her better over time, then that means that we're going in the right direction. And they graduated her from hospice. They did. <laughs> they finally said, this girl's, you know, we monitor her every day and we're looking for a decline and she's doing the opposite. She's not declining. She's, she's thriving. And so we had a big graduation party, you know, and her hospice team was here and in tears and so grateful too, you know. Hey, is that funny? <laughs> you know, to get to watch this, this was the world saying to us, this was doctors saying to us, this was, uh, this was the full confirmation of, you know what? Maybe she's not gonna die. <laughs> We're probably like, thank you. We've been saying that. There we are. Finally wake up. See, I don't know. I was grumps. I was tired. And so you can follow my fingers around. Let's go over here. Can you see over here? There you go. Oh, there we go. So right there shows that she can see it. It's just this low. Oh, there we go. And there we go. My name is Dr. Timothy Moore. I am a developmental optometrist that has been working with Lucy for the last several years. Lucy has something called cortical vision impairment. It's often also called cortical blindness. And that is a condition where there is damage within the brain that is in the visual cortex inside the brain rather than along the eyes or the visual pathway. As I was working with Lucy the very first visit, she responded to a very bright light. So that told me that if there was a way to enhance the potential for her vision, then we ought to take every opportunity to do that. If she doesn't have glasses, then the images that her eyes are presenting to her brain are out of focus and blurry. Her brain has no reason to improve its function. So putting glasses on her then sends a clear signal back to her brain that vision is working and functioning, driving the brain to have a reason to see clearly. I saw that as an opportunity to potentially improve her vision, and I wanted to explore that until proven that it wouldn't work, so that there was no stone left unturned, so to speak, that she could potentially see. When we initially prescribed glasses for her and had her wear them for a few months, when she came back for a follow-up, she clearly was following objects around with her eyes that with cortical vision impairment would initially you would think it'd be impossible, but yet she was doing it. Mm -hmm. 
the number one way that we interact with the world is through vision. For a child like Lucy, who has developmental concerns and delays, if we give her the ability to see the world around her, then that will minimize the influence, the impact of her delays on her growth and development and her ability to learn and experience the world around her. I love your little shoes too. These are fun. Okay, it's Lucy's first day of school. And she decided that she was gonna sleep. Oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> you know, we feel so blessed that we have this amazing school right in our area. You know, it's just such a special place, such amazing people. And, you know, the things that Lucy has access to is just, you know, it's a miracle that this is really something that, that she gets to partake in. I mean, she gets to horseback ride, she gets to swim. It's what dreams are made of when it comes to a school. Springtime follows autumn. Watch Lucy, you know, take part in activities that that all kids should get to do, um, or even more. It just fills my heart. Turn another page, my dear. It's slow down. There's no hurry. They had us so worried about quality of life, and um, I am not worried about her quality of life. She has a rich life, and she does so many fun things. Springtime follows autumn. Lucy tries hard all the time, with a good attitude. Tries her hardest all the time. Huh, Lucy? <laughs> See, she's kicking. <laughs> she's, like, <laughs> she's listening. <laughs> say love is free but it's more than you can see it's a she'll teach you everything well. that she needs even though she's a little kid it's she teaches the adults what she well. needs and she teaches you a lot about life too it takes more than Lucy has taught me how to live in the moment and to not, you know, worry about the future. She'll cry, she'll scream, she'll, she'll let all that out. But then the second the pain dissipates, then she's back to normal Lucy. Just stay with me a while. She 
She's never been bad. She's never been rude. She's never been jealous. She's never done anything wrong. I mean, she's never done anything wrong. I mean, who can you say that about? It's unbelievable, you know? It's just, it's just, she's so special. She's excited. You know, Lucy can teach people a lot when you look at her and how she looks at life and how she responds to life. She just has this light. She has this, you know, this aura of, of purity. All these little things are enough. She is just pure goodness. She is all good. It's just a pure reflection of, of all that is good is Lucy. You don't have to walk to run. You don't have to talk to say a lot. And you don't have to have wings to fly. And Lucy's been an incredible teacher of all of that for me. And um, I'll always thank her for learning those lessons. From the moment that we yes. met, hey guys, you were hey sweet girl. Oh, this could be the best thing that I'll ever know. You know, a lot of people, uh, you know, define a, a miracle as an instantaneous thing that happens. But for me, and the way I see, you know, Lucy is this is a miracle that takes time. This is a miracle that we're still in the middle of. This is a miracle that is not a, you know, a flash in a bolt of lightning, but this is a process. This could be the best thing that I'll ever know. You know, I believed in her, you know, being able to overcome NKH since the moment she was born, since the moment she was diagnosed. And, you know, I know, you know, one day we're going to look back on this time and be like, wow, we were in the middle of a miracle. There is always in us the hope of life to see things can change for the better.
My name is John Larkins, and, and I'm Lucy's grandfather. And uh, our little Lucy, she's like, man, what a, what a beautiful little granddaughter she is. She's just got the sweetest heart and, and the heart of gold. First, when we find out that she had this amazing um, rare disease, we we didn't know what to think or how to react. But it was mostly fear and concern and and the deepest feelings of uncertainty. But then, with time, it has turned into a great joy and a privilege to have such a special little girl like her. It has been a wonderful journey to be challenged, to learn, and and just enjoy one day at a time. So we have always something to look forward with her. How many people want to hold a six-year-old? It's, it doesn't really happen. Most of the time, six-year-olds are like, ooh, um, please stay away, you know? But with Lucy, she's like, she's got this thing about her where people are like, wow, can I snuggle her? Can I hold her hand? Or can I be close to her? It's really kind of, um, it says a lot about who she is and how, you know, genuine she is. Um, she really is just this, I, I relay it to, just an angel walking on earth like she is you know just inspired by god and it's like for me it is the kind of the closest you know physical thing that i can relate to feeling like i'm in the presence of something greater than just you know you know body and, and soul you know she really feels like she's connected to spirit time even things out Time replaces your doubts Here we are and she just lights up our whole life, you know? Here we are with this angel and she's just made our lives richer and our hearts bigger and more fulfilled. Lucy definitely understands and comprehends a lot more than people kind of think she does. She's seen all this. She's felt all this. She's, she's known that, wow, I got a lot of expectations to live up to. You know, she's had to do her part in this thing. You know, it's, it hasn't been just Grace and I hoping and believing. It's been Lucia hoping and believing herself. And we've instilled that inside of her. I used to know. I realized pretty quickly after having Lucy that... You know, we were given a mission, you know. I kind of grew up always feeling like this sense of, I might, you know, we want to do something big, that I might do something big. And I don't know, I thought it might be with music or, you know, who knows. But, you know, after Lucy came and things so calmed down, I had this aha moment. It's Lucy, that big thing, it's Lucy. You know, and she's gifted me with this mission where I really believe that that as a family, we have something to share. I'll take the burden of silence. It's extremely important for other families out there to understand and know that us sitting here today happy and fulfilled and just absolutely so blessed um this is a pretty picture and it's authentic this is where we are right now but life is up and downs but this does not mean that we did not go through hell Well 
Wait, one more thing. What? Just say we love Lucy. One, two, three. We, we love, love Lucy. Lucy. Living with fear is, it's a tricky thing uh, because it seems like the more you are afraid of something, the more you want to prepare yourself to kind of go through that experience. And, you know, Lucy actually taught me not to live in that space anymore. You stun like a cannon. You show the scars of your darkest night. Because she is not a fearful person. You know, and she's the one that, that has the disease. And it's really, you know, something that inspires me that if she can get over it, then damn it, I'm going to get over it too. It feels like your life is turned upside down. You can't see how this would ever fit. This doesn't make sense. This isn't my child. This, how can this be happening? But, uh, you know, I... There's hope. There's just so much hope. And there's so much beauty in every single person. Lucy, from the outside perspective, is this special needs girl that has all these challenges and problems. But from a perspective of a dad, a perspective of myself, She's never learned how to be anything but love. Okay, it's Lucy's first day of school. I have waited for you. I have waited so long. Lucy is exactly who she should be. She's exactly who my daughter is supposed to be in this world. And her place in this world holds as much value as anybody in the entire world. I absolutely believe that Grace and I were meant to have Lucy. I have waited for you. I have waited so long. She affects everyone around her. If they're lucky enough to know her, I hope everybody gets to meet a Lucy someday. And I just want to thank her. Thank you, Lucy, my baby. Thank you. <laughs> I have waited for you.
你。